Welcome to Journaling with Nature, the podcast for those who want to turn curiosity into wonder, a pencil sketch into a rabbit hole of discovery, a moment of stillness into a life full of joy. I'm your host, Bethan Burton. Let's open the pages of our nature journals and explore this world together. Hello, this is episode 72. Today's guest is an incredibly inspiring nature journaler who has made her home in Alaska. I'm speaking with artist Kim McNett. If you have ever dreamed of remote adventure, testing your strength physically and mentally, experiencing the absolute extremes of what nature can create, then Kim will definitely inspire you. Kim's adventures, along with her partner Bjorn Olsen, have taken her into some of the world's most remote and challenging landscapes. In all seasons and all weather conditions, Kim and Bjorn have travelled thousands of kilometres across remote parts of the Alaskan wilderness, travelling by fat bike, pack raft and sea kayak. Through all these adventures, Kim's nature journal travels along with her. In our conversation, we talk about these incredible adventures, the wild Alaskan landscape, and how nature can make you feel very small, but in a good way. <laughs> Let's listen. Kim, thank you so much for being here with me. I am ultra, ultra keen to chat with you. You're one of the most inspiring people I've ever met. So thanks for being here. Oh, that's too kind of you, Beth. And thank you so much for having me on. I'm really grateful that you do these podcasts. They're just delightful. (laughs) So let's go back. Let's talk about your relationship with nature as a child. Have, Have you always been connected with nature this way? Um, yes, a very immersive childhood in nature. Um, thanks to my parents for raising me in the temperate rainforest of the Pacific Northwest and outside was, um, my entertainment, um, as a girl. (laughs) And, uh, I just, I, I was never bored outside. There was always something to do. We have a creek and a pond and just these enormous trees. So I consider myself like raised in the woods. (laughs) Yeah. And how about art? Have you always been connected with art? Um, That as well, though, maybe a little more variable, but um, I I always have loved to draw and to admire art and look at art. And um, Mm -hmm. I think it was the carrying that into adulthood, um, maybe should happen more often um, among adults and children who love nature. So uh, I'm, I'm grateful that I continue to, to become a, an artist. Mm-hmm. I'd love to develop like how you came to be where you are. So you went to college. Tell me about your studies and how, how your career trajectory came mm-hmm. to this point. <laughs> yes. So I did just follow my passion, which was nature and ecology, and um, studied at the Evergreen State College in Washington, and really focused on temperate rainforest ecology and tropical rainforest ecology, fungi and mosses and lichens and all those fascinating wonders of of the (laughs) rainforest. And um, after I graduated, I I started working... um, as an environmental educator and naturalist interpreter in Port Townsend, Washington at the Marine Science Center there. And that opened my eyes to the marine world in a new way and also into this you know, career path of interpreting um, nature to people and to kids. I'd say that's kind of what led me up to Alaska because um, I, I got a job up here as an environmental educator with the Center for Alaskan Coastal Studies. And that's what originally brought me to Alaska. I had traveled in Alaska before, but that's what sort of moved me here. And I had no plan of actually staying here or becoming (laughs) Alaskan, but that's, that's what happened. I, I just stayed, I had my backpack and that's all I had here for (laughs) a few years until I realized that I was going to call this home. Yeah. Okay. So you live in a very unique, very wild part of the world. And I'd love for you 
to set the scene and talk a little about nature that you see when you literally step outside your door? Sure. So, um, I mean, Alaska is very, very, very vast. <laughs> and I think the part that appealed to me about it is that here humans and development um, are islands among the wilderness um, mm. rather than being in a place where the wilderness is this designated areas with very defined borders. Um, here it just surrounds you. So where I live in Homer, Alaska is not really the frontier. I mean, I live in a town of 8,000 people. We have all modern conveniences. I'm using high speed internet to talk to you right now. Um, but the, the, there are places in Alaska that do still feel quite frontier like in that way. And, um, and the, at this place here wasn't, it was that way not too long ago here. So we rent sort of an old log cabin um, that has no running water and uh, we have a wood fire. Um, but we, like I say, we have electricity and high speed internet and we're pretty close to town. Um, so I could go running to the post office is not a big deal. And um, when I step out my door, um, I'm on the shores of Ketchumac Bay and across the bay are just this amazing mountain range, the Kenai Mountains that have glaciers and the sun rises over them. And in the sea, there are marine mammals and I get to see seals and otters from out my window and birds migrating through. Um, and then on the other side of me is this wetland complex that's kind of right in the middle of town. So it's like a, mar a grassy marshland with moose and <laughs> owls in it. So I feel just really fortunate to live a life where I am in direct connection with nature pretty much all the time. Yeah, that is something else. That's something so special. Would you say that about Alaskans in general, that they are interfacing with nature regularly? Like uh, th there's less space between them and nature? I mean, I guess... It, get, it probably depends on who, because we do have a very modern life here. But even yeah. in, if you live in downtown Anchorage, you're going to get moose walking through <laughs> your yard and you're going to have a bear that would want to get into your trash can. So, um, and you see, you see incredible mountainscapes everywhere. So yes. um, it's, but it does amaze me at how much we are able as people to isolate ourselves from mm -hmm. it and mm -hmm. our tendency to want to do that. There's a, there's sort of a joke that, um, Anchorage is only 15 minutes from Alaska <laughs> when you're yeah when you're in the city it feels like you are in a city it's a very unusual city but it is very urban I guess what I was thinking a lot because when I think of Alaska Alaska is somewhere I've always wanted to go and when I think of Alaska I think of wild white snowy landscapes and and for me it's so far from my reality um, to have that sort of wintry scene. Um, and, and I would think that being close to the weather in that way is, um, something that you can't really ignore. <laughs> yeah. So that probably is a, a reality that most Alaskans face is that <laughs> exposure and the weather and the travel, um, you know, things are really spread out here and there are vast distances and often, I think this is a unique thing about Alaska in our, you know, in America is that um, you have lots of villages here that you really can only access remotely. So by, by ship or boat or by small aircraft um, wow. and, and there's all this whole, you know, communities and whole expanses of the state and hundreds of villages that do not have roads that go to them. You cannot drive there. Um, and, and one of the ways that people travel is in the winter on the frozen landscape. So the rivers will freeze, the snow falls on the tundra or the hills and, um, the sea near shore sea ice freezes and people put in trails, snow machine trails in between all the villages and that, and they all, tra that's how people travel around. Um, and move goods around. And so even if there's a village that, say, gets a, gets flights to it, 
a lot of people will then live out on the land and need to wait for the the rivers to freeze to bring goods up to their place or or in the summer take a boat (laughs) that blows my mind (laughs) that is amazing so you and your partner Bjorn Olsen have explored the state in a way that is so unique and so fascinating and I'd love to talk more about that. So Bjorn is a photographer, videographer, you are an explorer, artist, nature journaler and you take long distance wilderness treks with all sorts of amazing equipment, pack raft, fat bike. These are things I I knew about pack rafting. I love the idea of that. Fat bike, I didn't know what that was. Would you be able to describe these things to the listener who might not know what these things are? Yes, sure. And, you know, fat biking in Australia is something that some people have done it and we've entertained (laughs) the concept. So um, I guess the thing that I would try to encourage people to imagine is you know, huge stretches of unpeopled wilderness that do not have trails or Mm. routes or, you know, there are maybe ancient migration routes or indigenous routes, but there's no marked way to go. You have to find your own way across it. And um, bridges, for example, are not a thing. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And there's a lot of water. (laughs) So, um, So, yeah, so these modes of travel, when I met Bjorn, he really you know, taught me how to get across the wilderness in all of these ways. The first thing he really taught me to do was to sea kayak. And um, there's just so much coast in Alaska. Alaska has more coastline, I believe, than the whole rest of the United States combined. And there's just tons of islands um, and shorelines. So we did these mini, you know, multi-week, hundreds of miles trips in our kayaks um, and landing on beaches and camping at night. And, and then the other way that we travel is with these fat tire bicycles. And if you haven't seen one, just imagine like a jumbo, like super size my bike <laughs> sort of um, with, with the wheels and the tires. So they're really, they're, the tires look overinflated and fat. They're huge. And so that makes them more stable. It makes them so that they float. I like to wow. say it's like wearing a snowshoe. So if you imagine you're walking through the snow in a regular shoe and you're post holing, you know, your foot sinking in with every step, <laughs> and then you put a snowshoe on and you've increased the surface area um, uh, so that you, you can stay on top of that. And yeah. that's what the bicycle does. So it allows you to be able to bike on, um, you know, compacted, it can't be light, loose snow that doesn't work, but compacted snow trails or, um, natural, if you have the right conditions where the snow is firm or crusted or you have ice. Um, and then they're also good on dry tundra and on beaches. So we do, or river bars and, and any kind of natural corridor that is a firm surface that is a continue continuous line is what we ride them on so we do we do that in both summer and winter in the summer we bring a pack raft which is this small inflatable personal watercraft and a paddle that breaks down and we we can deflate that and strap that to our handlebars so if we get to a a crossing like a creek or a lagoon mouth we can get get across that and we put our bikes on them to cross them. This is so <laughs> incredible. So you're riding along on these t- huge tired bikes over outrageous <laughs> surfaces. And then you get to a river. What do we do? Take out the pack raft, literally just scoop up air into it, fold up the bike, put that on the raft, jump in. It's it's crazy cool. I love I love that. <laughs> It's get out on the other of, side. <laughs> yeah, it's like having a superpower. Yes. Because if you think about too, a lot of people travel on eight all train vehicle ATVs, you know, um, in the summer four wheelers and you get to water and you have to stop. So in a way, we're much slower than that per mile, but in the long term, we can go these really far distances. All we need to be sure of is that we've brought enough food and yes. we can go out for several weeks at a time and just keep every day, just make it a little bit further and a little bit closer and um, show up into these remote villages where people are just 
so confused as to I how. I was going to say, <laughs> yeah, are they astonished to see you? Yeah, often, you know, it's it's fun when that is the case. It depends <laughs> on, so so the, the winter stuff that we do are on, um, usually they're on winter trails. So these are trails that are put in for the season so that people can travel. And most people know about the Iditarod sled dog race and there are other um, dog sled races that occur around the state. And then there are just routes that get put in. And so there are certain routes that, that have become popular for riding these fat tire bikes on. The Iditarod is definitely one of them. So if you're on that trail, you're not unusual people have seen that a lot but um when you do it in the summer in some more remote places or if we're on some winter routes that people don't typically bike on then yeah people i think are a little surprised when we come out of you know what they know do they want to see all your equipment do they want to learn about what you're doing yeah there is a really funny um, period of time usually when people see us and then it they you can see the gears turning in their head because they're tar- trying to make sense of how this could be possible um, <laughs> and then they then they think about what question that they should ask first um, <laughs> like how do you have enough to survive that's surprises people how pared down our equipment is um, and yes. how small our kits are they they have to be or we're too heavy, you know, we have to stay light because we're moving it all ourselves. So, um, but questions are often, you know, where did you start and where, you know, where, where are you going and how do you <laughs> stay, you know, how, what do you eat? Those kinds of questions. Yes. Yes. I'm wondering about your skills. Cause you really need to know a lot of stuff. You said, um, you said that Bjorn helped you learn these skills. I'm, I'm interested in a in survival skills and how you picked them up did you train all that stuff um yeah it's it's been a fun process and journey but a tough one too there's been a lot of tears um yeah (laughs) I can imagine (laughs) yeah so I you know initially I was quite afraid of a lot of things like that you know the storms on the ocean are really scary and wind and um current and you know water is pretty terrifying um and so learning how to read that and learning how to read the weather um is probably the most fundamental skill to learn um learning how to be patient so that if it's not good you know how to judge that and then how to wait until it's good but often crossings when we have to go over large, you know, from a longer distance, like a couple of miles over water, um, you're moving so slow that the weather could change in that duration of time while you're out there. Mm -hmm. And so that's the challenge Mm -hmm. is trying to decide what it's going to do and how you can fit within that. And then it's still, I mean, there, it, sh- it should always be treated with tremendous respect. So learning, learning that respect um, took a lot of time, learning the confidence. And then, and then in the winter, to learning everything you need to do to stay warm and comfortable. Mm. Um, because we do go out in some pretty cold temperatures. Again, you're out there, so whatever happens in the environment is happening to you. There's no real escape at that time. So knowing what to bring and how to use it and um, how to keep yourself from starting down that, you know, slope of getting too cold. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, it's been, it, there, there's a lot and it's been a lot really fun. One thing that I heard you mention, you were talking um, on the radio, I think, about um, uh, a trip that you did in in the Arctic part of Alaska and and you talked about survival and that it takes humility. And I thought that that was a really interesting term to, to keep safe, just knowing where your limits are and when to stop. I thought that was really interesting choice of words, humility. Yes, (laughs) Yes, <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I, with, let's see, I guess that there's a lot of sort of 
backcountry attitude that comes with like, I am going to conquer yeah. this or I'm yeah. going to achieve this goal. Um, but the way I see it is that there's, there are forces out there that are so much stronger than human power yes. and human humans. And um, like just infinitesimally <laughs> yeah. uh, huge. And um, if you don't respect that, it's just a matter of time. You find you're going to find yourself in a, in a situation where you can't get yourself out. And uh, so I think that it's sort of a negotiation in a way. Mm-hmm. I, that's the way that I see it is mm-hmm. that you're traversing this landscape. It's the boss, like mother yes. nature's the boss, but she'll also let you through, you know, if you listen and do it on her terms. Yes. Oh, that's given me goosebumps. I, I feel like that uh, here in Australia, the ocean is a big part of life. And I often feel like that in terms of the ocean, when you're in the ocean, she will take care of you if you, if you behave yourself. <laughs> And if not, you can easily get swept out. You can easily get into trouble. But if you stay within the right limits, you're you're all good. (laughs) Yeah. And it's been really fun to learn about where our role within the landscape is Mm. because we evolved on the, you know, traveling and and crossing the landscape and it works for us. (laughs) Um, And so it's been it's been fun through our means to learn you know, what to look for in terms of where, where you can cross and where you can get through and, and then how to, when things do get bad, if it is really windy or if it is really cold, that strategy of hunkering down and just yes. enduring the time that it takes for those conditions to, to pass. Yeah. I'm so interested to hear about your relationship your relationship with Bjorn and and how, what lessons you've learned because you know you're working together under extreme conditions potentially life threatening conditions in this sort of pressure cooker environment and i'm wondering about like how you learned to work together and all that stuff how we didn't kill each other <laughs> <laughs> yeah basically <laughs> um yeah unfortunately might be an unusual situation um <laughs> So when I met Bjorn, I was, you know, enamored with what he knew how to do and his stories. He had all of these stories. I couldn't believe how many places he'd been and how many things he had done and like all of these things that had gone wrong or right or otherwise. <laughs> um, and he had one of these fat tire bicycles and he's riding it, n- you know, on the beach and as someone who's always loved exploring in the wilderness, I was infatuated with how would you do that? So I think that was part of the story is that it was very clear that he knew things to teach me um, and that I wanted to learn. And we did something though, we did something new together when we first met, we built a kayak together. We built a double, a tandem kayak. Wow. Yeah, and we did it not from one of those kits. We took out the plans and we cut all the pieces. And oh, wow. it was something that we ne- neither of us had done before. Um, so we were in this unknown territory together where we were trying to interpret these instructions or these measurements and asking each other, what do you think about this or that? And disagreeing on things and figuring out how to work through those differing views and (laughs) until we built a boat um and that seems pretty simple but in a sense I felt like once we finished that boat I felt like we could do anything together Mm. because we learned how to achieve a goal and and we we persevered through it despite the challenges and then that summer we um circumnavigated the Prince William Sound here which was I think over 500 miles and that's how I learned to kayak so we were together in the boat instead of being in singles where he was having to watch over me and instruct me I got to feel what he chose to do I got to see how he chose the heading and you know the strokes that he took in order to move the boat in certain ways and kinesthetically learned how to sea kayak that way. And that was really great. I recommend 
it, um, <laughs> and then after that, it was like, okay, now I know. Now we paddle singles. <laughs> <laughs> that must have been an astonishing feeling, an amazing feeling to build a boat and then put it in the water together and and have this amazing adventure. Yeah, and I think to 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 touch a little bit more maybe on the relationship part of the question. We both knew we are two people that really love the wilderness and we really want to explore it and we have that interest in common and it's so helpful to have another human being with out there to support each other and to make it more efficient and um and to have a second opinion about things and i think that we both just realized that the value of that would be worth whatever kind of compromises or sacrifices we would have to make otherwise because we want to have this life together where we prioritize these experiences in the wilderness yeah yeah i can imagine that it brings you very close to your partner when you're in a in a situation like that where you're making survival decisions together and i can imagine that just bonds you in a in a very strong way yeah i think it is it's that experience that did really bond us because we had to persevere together and really it's not always easy it's it's difficult but it is simple you're trying to achieve a pretty simple i mean individual choices may not be so simple but if you go out and you say we're going to try to get from this point to this point and uh and let's work together to do that um and you achieve that i feel like um it's a practice that can be applied to many challenges in life. And I, I like to encourage people to do wilderness trips and for, you know, kids and young adults to do them because I feel like it's practiced perseverance and confidence that then once you've finished that, you realize that you can use that same method in many other aspects and challenges of your life. Yeah, I can imagine that. I can imagine the strength that a young person would feel like, look what I just achieved. Like that would build you up in a way that you're ready for the next challenge in life. I love that. I'm wondering how you decide on your next adventure. <laughs> yeah, that's Bjorn's time to shine. He's really <laughs> creative. Like he, he'll he look at the map and he'll talk to people and he'll <laughs> He'll do his history, he'll, you know, he'll research and he'll learn about what other people have done in this way that it, it's one of his passions. So um, I come up with ideas too, but um, they're usually about how we're going to find this rare lichen or, you know, like <laughs> the bird might come here at this time or something like that. But um, Bjorn's really good at looking at the map and finding these kind of connections and things that nobody's ever thought to do before so he he can have that uh, <laughs> I'll be there to make sure that um all all of the the gear is certainly going to function properly or uh that we've packed right, the right things <laughs> <laughs> so uh so along with this amazing adventure story you both have your own creative input so Bjorn is a photographer videographer and you've got art and nature journaling and I love that you have this creative added extra thing for on both sides yeah we do we're both independent artists um and you know <laughs> it's it's an interesting way to make your way in this world but it's been really <laughs> fulfilling for both of us so we're both very project oriented people and we um like to take on you know these immersive jobs that will take us to remote places or offer us an experience and teach us something new about the landscape. So yeah, he's a photographer, videographer, and um, has had the opportunity to really spread the message about a lot of really important things that are happening in Alaska um, and, and raise awareness about the environments that are changing and the culture. Um, yeah. And then my, my personal practice is sort of comes from my science naturalist background. So I am an illustrator and I get to do a lot of really great projects related to that. And I'm also a teaching artist and I have my personal practice as well. So we, we both use our, our kind of self-made jobs 
to live the lives that we want to live and enrich enrich ourselves and to um, share important messages. I love that that you sort of describe. I've I've heard you describe elsewhere that you choose to live in a simple way so that you can have the flexibility and the freedom to um, create your own job in this way. Yeah, nothing terrifies me more than a full-time job, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> so you describe yourself as a teaching artist and I'm really interested in that terminology. Tell me about that. Yeah, so the um, this kind of has a history with my nature journaling practice as well. So um, we have uh, in the state of Alaska and all states um, a teaching artist in the schools program. So schools, public schools, will get funding to bring in guests, artists that um, will provide fine arts enrichment that isn't really part of the standard curriculum. Mm. So I have found that to be a really great way to travel to really remote and unique places to have this immersive experience and to share with kids uh, this amazing practice of keeping a nature journal and, um, and connecting with the place right outside and asking questions and getting curious and all of these things that we know and love about nature journaling um, and to create that inception. Um, and, and build that confidence in kids. So I've had the chance to go to really remote islands, the Aleutian Islands and Diomede Island, which is where you actually can see Russia from Alaska. It's in the Bering Strait. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, and in, in the Southeast, which is like the um, inside passage, you know, rainforest fishing community part of Alaska. Um, and then just right here as well, uh, where I live. So I'll, I'll teach locally too. Mm -hmm. So I do that. And then I do also just other workshops, um, and with adults and, and other opportunities like a featured artist of a event or things like this. Tell me about how you found nature journaling, how you came to it right at the very beginning. So nature journaling was a part of uh, one of the college courses that I took. So a botany class and we kept a nature journal and um, Claire Walker Leslie's book, um, Keeping a Nature Journal was, was a part of that. So that's how I yeah. first learned of this idea and started doing it. And then we did that in other courses that I took as well, a mycology um, course. And I've always loved to draw. So I I think did well with that and um, wanted to foster it more, but I'm a little, and, and this is where I feel <laughs> I'm a little opinionated is that um, <laughs> in, in a lot of science programs that will encourage you to draw, there's really not a whole lot of support for how to develop those skills both like the technical um, drawing skills, but also to see things in that creative way. And something that mm -hmm. now the nature journaling community has just really filled this niche. And there's so much more that's available to us to help start that practice and, and build up. So my own personal journey was pretty stagnated after graduating, even though I kept at it, I wanted to make these really technical uh, illustrations like you would see in a field guide. I want, that's what I would keep in my journal. And I would try to make them just as absolutely realistic as I could. And, um, and I would only really try to capture things that I could include every detail on, like a small things, like a flower. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was only just starting to break out of that and start to do things like draw landscapes, um, or birds from life when I got my first teaching artist residency here locally and somebody who, for me, I, I'm not an expert at, at anything. I'm not, I'm not an artist. I don't have an art background. I'm not a scientist. Um, so I was like, how do I teach how to do what I don't even feel like I know how to do. Um, <laughs> and that is when um, John Muir Law's book, uh, the nature drawing and journaling came out that year. And I mm -hmm. found it at my, local bookstore and <laughs> oh life-changing I mean <laughs> just so accessible and so many so practical and 
so useful to just apply to your own situation. Um, and so I was so grateful. And mm -hmm. at that time, he had some online, free online um, curriculum for teaching nature journaling. So I was able to use those. Um, and I reached out to him and it said, John, like, this is so great. Thank you so much. He said, <laughs> oh, call me Jack, you know, and like, we all know how kind and sharing <laughs> Jack is. Um, and he said, well, I'm writing a book now on, on how to teach nature journaling. And do you have any examples or photos? And so I sent him photos of my little residency that I'd done here um, and he included those in the book. So I was just so honored. And I feel like it um, really helped launch nature journaling as my primary artistic discipline. I got to say, oh, actually, this is this is the type of art that I do. I do yes. this direct observation, process-based, place-based journaling. Yeah, oh, that's, a, that's a really cool. I love that story. I'm thinking about in all this, I see play. And I wonder about your relationship to play. Does that word mean something to you? Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> you, you hit the nail on the head. It's... Um, it's so explorative and curiosity based and wonder based that yeah. as, as an adult, I feel like I'm just continuing to nurture that child in me that always was very curious about and fascinated by nature. And that is the journal is sort of the excuse in a way, <laughs> you know, Oh, I'm going to go examine this squid that I found on the beach for the next four hours because I, I'm a nature journaler. That's what I do. <laughs> um, and with that, I, I started to realize too that, um, you know, one way of seeing the nature journal is it that it's this documentation of your experience that you've, you're recording the stuff that's happening around you. But then I started realizing that actually my behavior is changing because of the nature journal. Mm because of this way that I'm going out and, and looking and examining, I'm seeing the natural world in a new way. I'm seeing how can I break something down or how can I monitor something and, and interpret it on this page and then share it with the world. And, and because of this, I'm going to go out and collect like some data about these trees and, and plot them up and then draw them. And so I found that the journal is a really effective way to foster that practice of that deeper engagement that you might not get if you were just say um, like trying to do trying to keep a diary of what you were doing, or even just to photo document what you were doing. You might look for the beautiful sunsets or flowers, but here I am in the middle of winter, walking around in the marsh, <laughs> seeking out in the dark with my headlamp because I really want to find this gall insect that makes this willow rose because for whatever reason yeah. I decided that's what I wanted in my nature journal that day, and I thought you know this is. This is so weird and I love it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it just has a, a, an energy and a playfulness and adventure all all wrapped up and I feel excited just chatting to you. <laughs> and that's something that's really fun to share with kids and kids yeah. fuel me. Um, you can make kind of a game out of anything and make a, a thing out of anything and they they'll bite you know and, yeah. and go for it and they see all of these things that you as an adult might not and they make these connections in these really interesting ways and then you see that they are so excited that they want to go home and do it at home and that really fuels me I, it's so fun to watch yes yeah kids are amazing and so inspiring in their own way I'd love to hear you talk about your relationship with your own body. And by that, I mean like your body is is taking you through these amazing places. It's a tool that's that's been in all these extreme situations and locations. You're testing your ability and its level of endurance. And I'm wondering about your relationship with your own body. Interesting question, Bethan. Wow. Um, hmm. One, grateful that it all works. It, the pieces are all yeah. in place, more or less. Um, I have <laughs> injured myself um, in the past, but I feel very grateful to have a healthy body 
that will allow me to do these things. And I don't take it for granted. I, yeah. I think about that, you know, that may not be the case forever or an accident could happen. That would really change my life um, because my life is so, you know, we, we do these fulfilling wilderness trips. Um, and then also art, I would hate for anything to happen to my hand. Mm-hmm. Um, but also I have kind of resolved that, I'm not going to let the reliance on my body determine how happy or fulfilled I am in life, because I think Mm -hmm. that's an unrealistic expectation. You know, it will eventually degrade. And, um, and if you stake everything in terms of your fulfillment and your enjoyment on your body functioning, I feel like you're just setting yourself up for, for a pretty harsh reality. Um, so there's that I try to take reasonably care of it. (laughs) Um, But I have had a lot of self-doubt around my body because I am a very slender figure and um, I don't consider myself some exceptional um, athlete um, or with these exceptional abilities. Um, So I think that I had a lot of self-doubts in the beginning uh, because these are very physical and they require a lot of strength and a lot of endurance. And, uh, I doubted whether or not I'd be able to develop that or build that. And, um, it, it, I definitely had to break in, in a lot of ways and it, it was not pretty or fun. Um, so I have, you know, I had to break in my arms on that first winter that, or that first, um, (laughs) first summer kayaking trip. Um, and then, uh, with biking, the first big winter trip that we did, I had a lot of concerns that maybe I wasn't big enough and strong enough for something like this. And that, uh, also being slender, would I get cold, would being cold be a really a more problematic thing for me? Mm -hmm. Um, and on our first big winter trip, I did end up kind of tearing my knee, uh, uh, it was like an overuse injury. Overuse injuries are what we, our primary concerns are because we, we're not doing like extreme downhill, taking big jumps. We're, we're doing things that are just long duration of time. Yes. So, um, that was pretty painful and I wondered if I should or could do this at all, but I persevered and I did some, um, self-prescribed physical therapy and corrected my alignment that had caused the problem in the first place. And once I did that, then I haven't had any problems ever since with my knee. Mm -hmm. So that was sort of a triumph in terms of the cold and the warmth. I've I've learned that actually being slender has, um, has a lot of unforeseen benefits. Um, I'm light, so I float, I don't sink as bad. (laughs) And uh, (laughs) I also don't have to move as much mass right around. Um, And then also (laughs) I don't sweat as heavily. So it's a lot easier to regulate my body temperature. And that in the winter is, is very serious. If you sweat inside your clothes, you get them wet and then they will, once it gets cold, they will freeze and you will, won't have your insulation intact anymore. So venting and and airing out sweat and keeping vapor vapor from getting into your gear is fundamental for winter travel. And I am able to manage that pretty easily. I need to make Mm -hmm. sure I have enough clothes with me. So on that, and then that, that's usually extra because I am slender, but I'm able to keep that, (laughs) uh, keep my body temperature regulated pretty well. Oh, that's so interesting. I would think, or I guess not to, not to interrupt. I guess I had a thought once while I was on a trip and and it was that, um, strength of body follows, um, strength of will or strength of Mm -hmm. mind. And I feel Mm -hmm. like that's been my quest that I've had the, just a determined, somewhat fierce attitude towards, um, embracing these big trips and, and that I've gotten strong because of that. Mm-mm. I'm fascinated by bodies, I guess, because my own story is that I used to do a lot of adventurous stuff, definitely nothing as extreme as you, but, you know, going out um, for days and weeks into the bush and hiking and climbing mountains. And then I got really unwell. And so I had to change my 
um, relationship with my body. And now I have a body that if I push it too far, I get very sick. And so that um, watching you, like watching videos of you out there, you know, charging through the, you know, pushing on through the snow in on a bike and all that stuff, it is fascinating for me and something that I'm really, that I, I love to see and connect with vicariously but yeah that that idea that the body is something that a tool that you use to get to where you want to be physically and emotionally is is some is a topic that interests me anyway <laughs> yeah and i really commend you for persevering through your hardship and for you know discovering the the healing um, power of art and your resolve i can see very much that you personally have worked to overcome that challenge. And um, I won't get too into Bjorn's story, but he has a similar story. Mm. And um, it was the way that he responded to that, that I think really made me fall in love with him. And um, I feel, I feel this way too, with, I guess, thinking of the body as also somewhat similar to the environment is that sometimes there are a lot of things about it that are not in your control and yes. you really are just needing to navigate that as gracefully as possible and we can't make the decisions about maybe what happens to our body all the time I mean we we can to a, to a degree and it's good to but and then what's happening to the environment but we make the choices of how we respond to that mm. yeah Kim that's beautiful I love that it's a really special insight um you're right. Sometimes you just have to flow with it and and make a meaningful life with what you've been given, and that's what I try to do every day. And it, but it did it did take a grief process because I was that active person, and then I had to change. But the life I'm living now is so much wider than the life I had at my worst, and so um, this conversation's taken a turn I wasn't expecting. <laughs> That's but okay. um, no, it's beautiful. And I think too, I've in my mind always thought that if something did happen to me that I couldn't go out and about like I do, that the the art and the nature journaling is most likely where I would find my grounding and my peace mm -hmm. because I feel now that I'm content. I mean, I'm, I can't say I'm fully content just looking out my window, but I am highly entertained by watching the crows yes. or, you know, what just the watching the, the flowers bloom. And um, I've, I've always had it in my mind that hopefully this is something that I always get to have a relationship with and that I always get to have as, as a source of fulfillment. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, that's special. Thank you for saying those things. That yeah, it was a really good insight. Um, so in Alaska, when I think of Alaska, as I said, I think of wintry, and I, I wonder about the your relationship with the seasons and what life looks like in different seasons. That the the change must be dramatic between summer and winter, and I wonder how that affects your um your art, your journaling. I know you do have a winter palette and I'm interested mm. in that as well. I'm wondering about the differences in the seasons you experience. Yeah, great question. Uh, it's it's extreme and it took me a lot of getting used to. I'm raised in Western Washington where we, it's not very, it's very temperate. Like okay. it just kind of rains all winter and is this gray, <laughs> moldy <laughs> <laughs> and then yeah summer is beautiful and everything but we don't get winter there at all mm -hmm. I mean I had never ice skated on an open pond before until I came here or saw the way that the the ice crystallizes the humidity out of the air or the um the light so I, I guess I'll I'll describe you know the winter world here yeah. is so beautiful in this way that I don't think I ever could have imagined before experiencing it. Um, you get this low angle light. It's it's not light very long in the day. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it doesn't, the sun doesn't get high above the horizon. So it's almost always this perpetual state of sunrise, sunset. 
And if it's cold and the landscape is white and frozen, it refracts all of this beautiful light. And, um, and then you get the crisp night skies and the Northern lights, if you're lucky. Oh Um, yeah. Yes. And so it's just this whole world. And also the landscape just opens up. I mean, if you get a lot of snow, it's, and, and that snow crusts over and, it covers up a lot of stuff and um, the the rivers freeze and the whole landscape is just totally transformed. And it's so open. You can see for so far, you can see across the water and uh, it's just beautiful. So last winter I did really embrace the winter scenes um, and I didn't necessarily paint all of it out there because it's Mm-mm. very cold. Um, <laughs> but, but just taking that time to focus on light and, and the negative space of the snow. Um, and then when spring comes, it all falls apart and it turns to muck <laughs> and the life, starts to migrate back here. So that's a, that's another just fascinating thing. The bird migration um, that comes in the spring is so exciting because there are these, all of these nesting birds that come up here because the food is so rich here in the summer, in the summer that they'll travel really long distances to come and they're your friends, but they've been gone for a really long time. And then you hear all their songs and their sounds and they're, they are all really excited and they have their best, dress on and they're they're flirting with each other and chasing each other and it's just (laughs) so exciting because you know that that you know summer is here is arriving um and then then summer itself is just extremely intensive um there's this narrow window of time for everything to do its thing. So photosynthesizing, nesting, and people to make their money and to go fishing. And just everything happens in this really concentrated period of time. And the sun, it never really even gets dark. So people just work like all night long and all day. And and it can it's very overwhelming. Um, and yeah. it's also the time that... Um, it would be the best to be a nature journaler because you can, you know, be (laughs) outside as long as there aren't too many bugs and the wind's not blowing. (laughs) But I find it very difficult to make the time um, unless we are out on those wilderness trips. So that has been something that's challenging is that a lot of the things that we do can only be done in this narrow window of time in the year. And that's also when all of these other opportunities are. So it's, it's always difficult to choose how to prioritize your time in the summer here um, because it's so fleeting and it's so energy intensive um, and then it's gone. And then, and then this time of the year it's, Oh, we're settling back in and you have time to chat with friends again. Um, And uh, it's just a, a very different scene. So um, I, I would say that Alaska kind of feels to me like, each year is like one really long night and one really long day. That is wild. It must, by the time this part of the year rolls around, you must need a rest. Do you feel like almost like, yes, okay, time to rest? Oh my gosh, yes. Yeah. So, and <laughs> this is something again with lifestyle choice that we've gotten better at is um, trying to be a little bit more sustainable in the summer um, mm. because working as a wilderness guide, for example, or an environmental educator, you, by the end of August, you are just completely depleted and yes. all you want is for it just to end. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, so, uh, but, um, and I think this is something that the pandemic, um, in a uh, silver lining of the pandemic for us, well, here, we actually had a summer that was for the locals. Um, and mm-hmm. that was a yeah. really unusual, And I think a lot of people really recognize how wonderful it is to take some personal time in the summer and to do the thing that you always wanted to do and to go camping. Um, A lot of people just end up not going fishing or camping, even though they'd love to. Uh, So that was sort of beautiful. And um, it made us sort of reset the way that we approach that summer season um, to try Mm -hmm. to find the time to do a lot of our. wild crafting and and wild foraging and and camping and visiting family and um you know things that are hard to when we say make the time for i think Mm -hmm. it's all i think it's really just about choosing 
what you use your time for. Yes, that is so, so fascinating. I I can feel the the extremeness of it when you're talking about it and the rhythm as well. Wow. <laughs> so this year you were a teacher at the Wild Wonder Nature Journal Conference online and you presented a, a virtual field trip to a glacier in Alaska. And I'd love for you to talk about this experience of teaching for Wild Wonder and then we'll talk more about this glacier and the, the whole the whole process. Yeah, I was really grateful for the opportunity, but of course, very nervous. Um, it's we, you know, within this community talk about the imposter syndrome where you're not yeah. sure if you're qualified <laughs> or not to uh, talk about something. So, um, but this <laughs> glacier, um, I, I actually can see the glacier from my window. It's across Ketchumac Bay. Oh, wow. Um, it's, it's called Gruink Glacier. Um, and it's a place I've visited regularly um, since living here and um, a place that I guess I feel like I have a personal connection to and that also has a lot of relevance for a lot of scientific purposes um, and uh, observational purposes. So it, like all valley glaciers in Alaska, I mean, and maybe I can't say all, but darn near all valley glaciers in Alaska are melting very, very rapidly. Mm -hmm. um, and all of them are places of obvious climate change and, and really, really dramatic rapid change on the landscape. Um, but this one is, uh, it's a pretty large glacier, so their changes are big. And um, it's, it's reasonably accessible. So um, I'm uh, friends with a few scientists that have been monitoring it regularly for a number of things. So the... Um, the face of the glacier and how quickly it's retreating, the, the depth, so the altitude of the ice and how quickly that's declining, and then how the um, landscapes and the slopes around it are um, unstable because of that rapid retreat. But that's, I guess, about the glacier. Um, in terms of talking about teaching at Wild Wonder, I just was really happy to have the opportunity to do a virtual field trip because I felt like that was what really spoke to me personally like I like to go out and about mm -hmm. and I like to show people what's out there too as a guide and I like to expose people to new things and so it felt like a natural fit for me to do a virtual field trip where I would just take people um to this place where I would like to take them um and and do some sketching and everything which is something I love to do yeah, and this is a place most people won't go in their lifetime, but something really exotic for me, especially down here in in Australia. And um, I loved seeing what you did. But when when you're talking about glacial retreat, and one thing that you showed during the field trip is the, a photograph of this place, and then ten years later, and it's incredibly dramatic what has happened there. the The difference between those photos was quite shocking, and um, I. I'm interested because for a lot of people, climate change is out there in a different place or in a different time and they it's hard for them to connect to it. But for you, um, up in Alaska, climate change is an everyday reality and I, I'd love to hear a little bit about that if, you, if you're okay talking about it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's one of – climate change is one of those things that I think is tough to – just look at any point in time and say, hey, look, that's climate change. Yes. Um, and I don't think we should really view it that way. That's um, it, it, it is such a bigger system than mm. that. And there are a lot of things that we can't really perceive on a minute to minute scale. But you it doesn't take a whole lot to realize what's happening because there um, is we, we have our scientific knowledge about weather patterns and changes in climate history. We have our personal accounts from people here who talk about how things were decades ago. Um, and then, yeah, we just have um, these anomalous events that are occurring all the time. And so I, um, I guess what I can see is that combined with that past knowledge, and what we see now, there's a lot of really obvious drastic changes that are occurring. So 
one of those being the winter conditions, winter trail conditions, um, and how these used to be quite reliable now are becoming less and less so. So you'll get really unusual high snow events or no snow or warming and rain or um, ice conditions that don't really set up. So, and unpredictable times. And so the Iditarod Trail, which we've talked about, has had to be rerouted twice now to a different starting location because the lack of snow on the trail. Um, And then sea ice is, you know, all time lows and um, just really impacting the ecosystem out there and how, how significant sea ice is to the whole cycle and the whole season. and, And, and the whole food web is something that I've learned a little bit more about recently and didn't quite appreciate from a distance just how integral the ice formation is to things like the life cycles of the walrus and of the plankton and the fish and the birds that depend on those fish. So we're starting to see some really unusual things start to happen here as that starts to change. Mm. I found a quote from you and it was from a website or a, a program called Girls in Icy Fjords. And you said, it's my belief that the greatest challenges facing our planet will be solved from solutions that come from the heart. Mm. And I thought this was really super powerful. And I'd love for you to talk about that, about getting the heart involved to to create action. Yeah, that's nice. Thanks for finding that. The Inspiring (laughs) Girls expedition was a really fun thing to be a part of. It's um, a wilderness science trip for teenage girls uh, that don't necessarily have those backgrounds. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, yeah, we did our trips in the Kenai Fjords around melting glaciers. And um, that was a really central theme to the trips. But um, I suppose that the there would be sort of two big approaches to our climate problem. You know, one of them is like this, how do we engineer our way out of it? We need to find all of these better technologies that, that are going to, you know, mask the effects of climate change or, and I mean, obviously alternative energy is going to be central to um, stopping this problem or reversing this problem. Um, but it does bring to question our sense of values and where we've placed that in this world. And um, that if we, I guess, don't learn to view our relationship on this earth and with each other in with a bit more humility, you know, we talked about humility in the face mm-hmm. of the weather. Mm-hmm. And um, I think that that people aren't going to really um, take change without having that sense of value and um, of for what they would want to protect. And mm-hmm. it's the question is, can we engineer our way out of it? But do you, what type of a world do you want to engineer yourself towards? Like, what do we want in our experience, our human experience on this planet? And is, you know, biodiversity one of those things that we are prioritizing because if we don't, we're uh, really running the risk of of losing that and compromising that pretty heavily. Yeah, you and, can't go back. You can't go back from that, can you? Right. These species take so long to diverge and evolve and only a very short window of time to go extinct. And if you look mm-hmm. at the historical record, you know, there are these massive extinctions and die-offs and they take a very, very long time to recover. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that inherently humans all do like animals and diversity but I maybe we don't quite have that connection to how our actions and the things that we do um interact with that um and it's something that we've sort of lost touch to I I guess I feel that um with solving things from the heart it has to do with ethics and it it has to do with um, having compassion for creatures other than ourselves and and for generations other than our own. Mm-hmm. Generations other than our own. I love that. That's a really powerful way to state it. Yes. <laughs> Future generations 
and even respect for past generations for the knowledge that that's come before us that we should have been listening to for a long time. <laughs> and I think that's why your work taking girls outdoors, taking them to the fjords, showing them that you're really a part of this system and that there's this majestic world out there. It's That's a powerful thing. Yes, I've heard the argument that it would be better for the environment if people lived in higher concentration in cities and and then and then and and allowed for more wild spaces to exist without our interfering with them and mm. i guess i do see that logic but i have a hard time with it because i see my relationship to nature being really centered on this very hands-on personal connection where um, you know, I'm collecting firewood or, you know, catching fish that then I'm eating and is then keeping me warm. Yeah. And there's this really direct connection between like what's going on in the habitat and what that means for me. And I, I guess I would be saddened to think of a world where nature became such, such a rarity that we had to like put it behind glass and say, we yes. can't touch this or we're going to mess it up. And, and, and humans don't belong here. And yes. I feel like where my soul belongs is in nature and interacting mm -hmm. with it. And that's mm -hmm. where I get the deepest connection. And, um, you know, people who garden, um, for example, have a connection to that source. And um, I, I think, you know, the, the leave no trace ethic, I, obviously there is huge value in that if you have a place that is very sensitive and there are a lot of people visiting it and if you if you didn't say that it would go get ruined um mm -hmm. and that's very true but but i also feel that you know having that expansive enough wilderness that your personal human touch is not going to <laughs> diminish it or you know i mean that is now a line that we really are straddling um and i it's just my hope that we can you know live in a world where people are actually growing closer to nature yes. out of a result of what's happening on our planet right now rather than further removed from it mm. when you're speaking it's reminding me of something from your virtual field trip which is a photo of this massive glacier and a tiny and you your crew on a tiny on tiny kayaks and I'm wondering about that feeling that you get when you're tiny in an expansive landscape what tell me about that oh yeah tiny puny <laughs> pathetic really like you know <laughs> that you realize just how insignificant you are yeah um, it puts things into perspective yeah I think it's something that shocks people maybe when they would <laughs> first come here um is to see the grandeur of the mountains and the expansiveness of the sea and just be like terrified you know <laughs> because yeah you yeah yeah you're not the boss out there um <laughs> uh, uh that's i think the part of the appeal to me i i see um like things that are terrible are also like beautiful because of that like great and terrible and beautiful and yes. and awe inspiring you're in front of it and you're just moved because it's just yeah. so enormous and expansive um and i guess you know i have felt very weak and small out in getting stuck out in a, in a storm on the sea and those little blow up rafts get blown around and you are super vulnerable out there so i've had some really harrowing like get to the shore and kneel down and grab the sand because you love it so much uh, yes. <laughs> situation. Um, yeah. And uh, there's a, another uh, phenomena I've noticed when we're doing our winter trips with the fat bike and we're out there and sometimes, you know, as far as the eye can see winter landscape with no people and you feel so small and you're moving so slow over something so vast. Um, and then you get to a village and for whatever reason, you need to bring your bicycle inside the building. So we're going to bring the bike inside the school and you roll it in through the doors and, and you come in and you're just dressed in all these layers and these big puffy fur hat and big boots <laughs> and everything like that. And now all of a sudden I feel 
enormous. Like I feel yeah. oversized. This bike is oversized and it's got a bunch of gear and I'm huge. And so it's just that really interesting context, <laughs> like that shift of like, I was so tiny when I was out there and now I'm like Whoa. way too big. <laughs> That's fascinating. <laughs> yeah. I- I'm interested in capturing the different scales in your nature journal. So landscape scale you know you tiny next to a glacier and then you I know you love to do tiny details of fungal spores and stuff like that (laughs) tell me about shifting your focus from wide to tiny yeah I you know um John Muir Law's last send zoom in zoom out is my favorite um I I love (laughs) doing that with the kids um I have these magnifiers that I uh, that I have a classroom set of these 10 X magnifiers. And I save that until a few days in and, you know, they're kind of getting used to the routine and starting to maybe lose a little bit of interest. And then you take those out and all of a sudden, boom, the world just a opens new world. up. Yeah. A yeah. whole new world. And they're <laughs> now like crawling around within a 10 foot radius and completely, you know, uh, infatuated uh, with the world. <laughs> and um, I, I do enjoy both of those scales very much, um, large landscapes and then very up close. And, um, I think that I see a similarity in that, in that when, if you get magnification, you have a lens and you can see something, it's sort of like opening up a whole, you know, landscape or a whole galaxy. Mm -hmm. And, um, we do a lot of tide pooling, which I think you call rock pooling where you Mm -hmm. yeah go to the uh, beach and, and you, you check out all of the life on the rocks as, as when the tide is out. And, um, you know, that's a great example of it. I mean, you can get down on your knees and, and look closely and all of a sudden it's like you're peering into a nebula of yes. intricacy. And the closer you look, the more that there is to discover and see. And um, I very much am attracted to that. And so I, I do have a microscope that I occasionally use and I really like adding that to the journal because I think it shows people that if you scratch the surface a little more, there's more to see. And Hey, hadn't you even thought about what it might look like uh, up close at a higher magnification that your eye can't see. Um, Yeah. I get a lot of enjoyment out of that. I'll bring a magnifier with me on some of our trips just for that purpose. Uh, Amazing. Kim, My cheeks hurt from smiling. I'm so, so happy to have had this conversation. I could talk to you literally for hours, but we should probably stop. Thank you so much for being a guest. Oh, thank you, Beth. And I would love to come down to Australia and do a trip down there. And if you ever want to come to Alaska, you've got to welcome Matt here too. Amazing. Thank you, Kim. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Kim. I loved hearing her speak about respect and humility in a survival situation, knowing that the landscape is the boss, and when you listen to and follow the rules, you can come safely out the other side of these testing situations. I was fascinated to hear about the extreme and concentrated intensity of the seasonal changes, and the flurry of activity in summer, and how folks are then ready for some rest and calm during winter. It's so different from my own experience of seasonal changes here in Australia, where the shifts are much more subtle. Please visit the show notes for this episode where you'll find lots of links to Kim and Bjorn's work. I especially recommend you explore the In The Media link, where you can read lots of articles and watch videos of their adventures, which will really make the whole thing come alive. I don't know about you, but I love having vicarious adventures <laughs> and Kim and Bjorn really take you along with them through the videos and articles that they've created. I'd like to take a moment to thank the patrons who support Journaling with Nature podcast. Your support helps very much and it's deeply appreciated. If you're a regular listener and you'd like to sign up to support the podcast for as little as $1 a month, you can find the link to the Patreon page in the show notes as well. I'd love to have you join us there. Thank you so much for listening. See you next week.